Chapter 2, The Cleanest Dog in the USA Henry! Ribsy! Henry and his mother and father had been splashing up and down the aisles of the parking area of the shopping center for almost an hour, calling and searching for their dog. Finally, they gathered, damp and discouraged, in the new green station wagon. He isn't any place in this entire parking area, said Mrs. Huggins, sinking wearily back in the front seat. Do you suppose somebody stole him? Henry could not understand Ribsy's disappearance. He's not what you would call a valuable dog, said Mrs. Huggins. He's hardly the kind of dog someone would want to steal. I call him a valuable dog, said Henry glumly, even if he doesn't have a pedigree. Henry, who did not like to go shopping, was tired and hungry. It seemed to him they had spent hours trudging around the shopping center, looking for bargains and more hours slogging around the wet parking lot searching for Ribsy. Somehow he must have bumped against the button that made the automatic window go down, and then he jumped out, guessed, Mis guessed Mr. Huggins. Henry brightened. I know. Ribsy got tired of waiting, so he started home all by himself. I bet he's home right now waiting for us on the doormat. Henry had wanted to start home a long time ago himself. He had wanted to start home as soon as he reached the shopping center. The only reason he had come in the first place was to ride in the new station wagon. Let's hope so, Mr. Huggins started the car. Henry settled back to enjoy the sound of the new motor. It was so smooth, it made their old car sound like a piece of junk. He had nothing to worry about. Ribsy would be waiting at home. Ribsy, however, was riding in the opposite direction from home in a blue station wagon with a family named Dingley. The Dingley children were called, <clears throat> from the oldest to the youngest, Zibby, Luann, Sally, Lisa, and George. George was a fat 20-month baby with a beautiful golden curls. All five children were busy petting the nice doggy. This was much more fun than petting a stuffed animal. Ribsy understood that small children, like the puppies in the pet shop window, were too young to know what they were doing, and so he was patient. He had learned this from long experience with Ramona. Just be patient, and pretty soon they would stop. It took a lot of patience to wait for five children, who had never owned a dog, to tire of petting him. When at last he was free of all those hands, Ribsy enjoyed a good hard scratch. Doggy! cried George, joyfully. George can say doggy, Luann was proud of her little brother. It looks to me as if the doggy has fleas, observed Mrs. Dingley, as the station wagon sped out of the city toward the subdivision of new houses. Zibby took charge. We will give him a bath, she announced. I would love to help give him a bath, said Luann. All the girls were delighted with the idea. This had looked like another long rainy Saturday, and now look what happened. They had a dog to wash. In the bathinette? asked Lisa. No, silly, said Zibby. In the bathtub. He can't scratch it because there's a rubber mat on the bottom. I don't know about that, said Mr. Dingy as they turned off the highway, Dingley, as they turned off the highway onto the side road. Oh, I think it will be all right, said Mrs. Dingley, if they clean out the bathtub afterward. She did not want to discourage her children's initiative. She was also glad they had thought of something that would keep them entertained on the long, wet afternoon. Zibby threw her arms around Ribsy and said, I just love the dog, and I hope we get to keep him. Ribsy, who knew that Zibby was almost as big as Henry Huggins, and therefore old enough to know what she was doing, wriggled free. Don't get your hopes up, said Mr. Dingley. He's too well fed to have been lost long. Someone is sure to be looking for him. The family drove into the double garage of a ranch house under some fir trees. Ribsy jumped out with the children and barely had time to pause by a bush before Zibby grabbed him. Come on, doggy, she said, picking him up and lugging him into the house. Ribsy struggled. He did not like to be carried. Now can we give him a bath? asked Sally. Put your raincoats and boots away first, said Mr. Dingley. The four little girls ran to their rooms, the older girls to hurl their raincoats and boots on their beds, the younger girls to drop theirs on the floor. Ribsy trotted nervously from window to window, putting his paws on the sills and whimpering to get out. He had not liked all those little hands petting him, and he felt uneasy in this strange house. George tottered after Ribsy and seized him by the tail. Doggy, he said. Mother, he said doggy again, marveled Luann. George was such a smart baby. 
There was nothing for Ribsy to do but be patient until George got tired of his tail. He heard water running in a bathtub, but this did not interest him. He had heard water run into a bathtub often, and he knew it had nothing to do with him. Maybe we should feed the dog first, suggested Sally. Zibby had the answer. You weren't supposed to eat for an hour before going swimming. I bet the owner will be glad to get a nice clean dog back, said Luann. Here, doggy, coaxed Zibby. Ribsy looked questioning, questioningly at her and then followed, because he thought she was going to let him out of the house. Good doggy, said Zibby when they reached the bathroom. She seized him around the middle and dumped him into the tub of warm water. Ribsy was taken completely by surprise. Nothing like this had ever happened to him before. On the rare occasions when Henry Huggins gave him a bath, he used a laundry tub in the basement. Then Ribsy knew what was coming, and he could hide behind the furnace. Henry always caught him eventually, but Ribsy at least had the fun of, li of a lively chase around the furnace, and maybe even up the stairs and through the house if Henry had forgotten to close the basement door. But this! Ribsy scrambled frantically, trying to get a toehold. Water splashed all over the row of four girls, who screamed with delight and would not let him out of the tub. Ribsy barked to tell them he did not like this one bit. George toddled into the bathroom. Doggy? he inquired. Doggy? He says doggy all the time, marveled Luann, wiping water out of her eyes with her sleeve. Ribsy gave up the struggle. Once more, patience had to be the answer. He simply stood, his head and tail drooping, waiting for this miserable adventure to end so he could escape. Where's the soap? demanded Zibby. Somebody get me the soap. Sally handed her a cake of soap from the wash basin and the four girls took their washcloths and went to work. Their efforts made Ribsy even more miserable. He was sad and he was soggy. The two fat little hands, one of them clutching a plastic bottle, pushed between the girls. Crowing with delight at his own cleverness, George emptied an entire bottle of violet-scented bubble bath over Ribsy. George, cried Luann, not the whole bottle. Bubble bath. Joyfully, Sally and Lisa began to swish their hands in the water to make bubbles, lots of them. Giving a dog a bath was fun, but giving a dog a bubble bath was even more fun. Eight hands and a whole bottle of bubble bath can make lots of bubbles. The girls screamed with pleasure as Ribsy found himself surrounded by billows of bubbles that were rising higher and higher. The white tub, the screaming girls, the foaming stuff were all too much for Ribsy. He was through with patience, and he was getting out of here. With one tremendous effort, he sprang out of the tub, pushing his way between two of the girls, and raced frantically down the hall, trailing water and bubbles behind him. Unfortunately, he did not know where to go, so he raced through the living room and into the kitchen, into the dining room, and back to the living room, where he started all over again with the four little girls, followed by their mother and father, running after him. Around and around they went, until at last he found some refuge among the legs of the chairs under the dining room table. There, trying to shake off the hateful, smelly stuff, Ribsy sent drops of water and bits of foam flying in all directions. Oh, dear, said Mrs. Dingley, realizing that she had made a mistake in encouraging quite so much initiative. Ribsy barked at the Dingleys through the chair legs. How are we going to rinse him? wailed Luann. Ribsy barked louder. We can't leave the poor thing covered with bubble bath, agreed Mrs. Dingley, who was remarkably calm under the circumstances. With five children and a wet dog in the house on a rainy day, she had to stay calm. George did it, said Lisa, who was often blamed when things went wrong. He wasted a whole bottle of bubble bath. Tattletale. Luann always defended her little brother. It was time for Mr. Dingley to take charge. Zibby, let the water out of the tub and fill it with fresh water, he directed. Luann, see if you can find some old bath towels. While he gave orders, he was pulling the chairs away from the table. Before the last chair was removed, Ribsy made a dash for freedom, only to discover he still had the same problem. There was no place to dash to. The kitchen and living room had not helped before, so this time he ran down the hall and tried a different room. It was a bedroom, and he promptly crawled under a bed, way back as far as he could go. It was dusty, and between the fluffs of dust and the perfume of the bubble bath, Ribsy sneezed. He sneezed a second time and was beginning to feel chilly after the warm water. 
By now he was too miserable to bark or even to whimper. He's catching cold. Luann was on her hands and knees peering under the bedspread at Ribsy, huddled in the corner. The rest of their family got on their hands and knees, too, and there was Ribsy, hemmed in by a row of faces. Do you think he'll bite? asked Sally, the worrier of the family. I don't think so, said Mr. Dingley. He looks like a pretty good-natured dog to me. Ribsy did not bite people. Once in a while he might try to bite another dog who provoked him, but not people. He was not angry. He was baffled. He could not understand the smelly stuff that foamed all over him. It didn't hurt. When he tried to bite it, all, it, all he got was an unpleasant, unpleasant taste in its mouth. Get some hamburger, ordered Mr. Dingley. Maybe we can coax him out. Mrs. Dingley left the room and returned with a lamb chop, which she handed to her husband. We're out of hamburger, she explained. The girls ate it all last night. Mr. Dingley held the chop out to Ribsy. Nice, doggy, he coaxed. Come and get it. Ribsy did not care for the lamb chop. In all the excitement, he had lost his appetite. Besides, he was cold. Look, he's shivering, reported Luann. We'll have to move the bed, said her father. Get ready, everybody, to catch him in case he makes a dash for it. Then he pulled the bed away from the wall. Ribsy did not appear. He moved with the bed, and this time he crawled to the center. He did not intend to come out while all those people were there. I'll get the dust mop, said Mrs. Dingley. The dust mop did it. Ribsy did not like being poked with that fuzzy thing, so he backed away. I've got him! Zibby was triumphant as she grabbed Ribsy by the hind legs. Come on, boy, said Mr. Dingley gently as he took hold of Ribsy's hind legs and dragged him out from under the bed. Ribsy, who now had fluffs of dust added to the bubbles, struggled and tried to dig the claws of his front feet into the slippery floor, but Mr. Dingley was too strong for him. The man lifted him and carried him back to the bathroom, where he dropped him, still struggling, into the tub. This time Ribsy knew he was trapped. He knew he could not scramble out of the slippery tub when he was hemmed in by all those people. He simply stood, dripping and drooping, and waiting for whatever was to come next. Eight small hands and two large hands began to try to rinse him, but they soon discovered that bubble bath was not easy to rinse away. The more they rubbed, the more Ribsy foamed. I'm sorry, old boy, said Mr. Dingley. This is no way to treat a nice dog like you. At the sound of a sympathetic voice, Ribsy turned a sad face to Mr. Dingley. We didn't mean to be unkind, said the man. He took a plastic cup and began to pour water over Ribsy. That seemed to work better than trying to rub the bubble bath off. So the girls ran and got cups and doused Ribsy thoroughly. Still, he was not free of bubbles. I know, the shower. Mr. Dingley pulled the plug in the tub, drew the shower curtain, reached inside, and turned on the shower. Ribsy was startled to find water falling down on him inside a house. This had often happened out of doors, but never before in a house. It frightened him. Whimpering, he tried to get out, first at one end of the curtain, and then the other, and then in the middle, where his claws slashed the plastic. Daddy, don't let him out, screamed Zibby. Mr. Dingley finally had to duck under the shower curtain and hold Ribsy. That's all right, boy, he soothed as his shirt became soaked. We'll have you fixed in no time. Ribsy was reassured and stopped struggling. With that much bubble bath, he didn't leave a ring around the tub, and so we don't have to scrub it, observed Libby when the ordeal was over and her father had gone off to change into dry clothes. That's nice. Mrs. Dingley stopped, sounded tired. Ribsy shook himself as hard as he could, spraying the girls in the bathroom with drops that still smelled of violets. He was soon surrounded by towels and rubbing hands. He did not mind being dried. Henry Huggins had always dried him after a bath, but he did object to smelling like violets. He felt that if he could manage to get free of those hands to get out of that bathroom, he could run away from the smell. He's still pretty damp, said Mrs. Dingley, when they grew tired of rubbing Ribsy. Now that the family had a wet dog on his hands, no one knew quite what to do with him. I wish we had left him in the parking lot where we found him. I always knew it would be fun to have a dog, said Luann wistfully. We'd better not let him catch cold, said Zibby. We might get a reward for him. I'll turn up the furnace, said Mr. Dingley, appearing in a dry shirt. Maybe we can coax him to stand over the heat. But Ribsy, persuaded to the furnace outlet, did not care to stand over it. He did not like breathing hot, dry, violet-scented hair. He pulled away from Zibby, who was trying to hold him. 
Seeing no way to escape from the house, he jumped up on a comfortable chair, as was his habit in the Huggins house when no one was looking, and tried to curl up in the smallest possible space. Mrs. Dingley, who was a very calm woman, was not that calm. Don't let him lie in that good chair when he's all wet, she said, and her husband pulled the unwilling dog to the floor. Maybe we could use Mother's hair dryer, suggested Zibby. We could dry one piece of him at a time, starting with his head. He would never stand still for that, answered her father. My, it's warm in here, said Mrs. Dingley. There must be some way to dry a dog without roasting the whole family. Ribsy tried to jump on the couch and was pulled to the floor. I know, Mrs. Dingley had an inspiration. I once read in that pet column in the paper that one way to dry a dog is to take him for a ride in the car with the heater turned on. It seems like a silly idea at the time, but it might work. It also might get all the children and the dog out of the house for a while so she could enjoy a little peace and quiet. She was beginning to feel like she needed it. The girls all agreed that this sounded fun. Can we, Daddy? Please, can we? They begged. Mr. Dingley was amused. I guess it wouldn't hurt to give it a try, he conceded. And I can dry my hair at the same time. Get your jackets on. Mr. Mrs. Dingley reached for a mop to start swabbing out the bathroom. And so Ribsy, along with the four girls and George, were bundled into the station wagon. The windows were closed and the heater turned on. Mr. Dinkley drove aimlessly around the neighborhood while the girls petted and consoled the damp dog. As Ribsy began to dry, the windows of the station wagon began to steam. Mr. Dinkley wiped the windshield with the back of his hand so he could see to drive, and the girls polished their windows with their sleeves. Ribsy tried to curl up on the seat and ignore the whole situation as best he could, but Zippy boosted him to his feet. You won't dry all over if you lie down, she explained. Gradually, Ribsy, whose hair was medium long, except on his ears, where it was short, and on his tail, where it was long, dried. He felt more comfortable, and the mean hungry flea no longer bothered him. It had been driven off by the bath, or perhaps it was too stunned by its experiences to bite. In some ways, things were better for Ribsy, but in another way, they were worse. He still smelled of violets, except that no violets ever smelled that strong. The perfume of violet is sweet and gentle. Ribsy raked. Luann buried her face in his hair. Mmm, she inhaled. You smell pretty, just like flowers. He must be the cleanest dog in the USA, remarked Zibby. Ribby's sensitive nose did not care at all for the pretty smell, which was not only unpleasant to him, but made him uneasy. Smelling strongly of violets as he did, he could not smell anything else. A dog depends on his nose to tell him a lot of things, the most important of which is the presence of danger. He certainly smells strong, said Mr. Dingley, like a whole field of violets. He turned the car toward home, and as he drove home, he began to sing. Uh-oh, that means I have to sing. Sweet violets, sweeter than all the roses. The girls were delighted. They had never heard this song before. Sweet violets. They joined in, sweeter than all the roses. It was a good song for singing at the top of their voices. Okay, if I do it, you have to too. And, but, and that way, the four girls and their father sang, sing with me, guys, sweet violets, sweeter than all the roses, covered all over from head to toe, covered all over with sweet violets. <laughs> when they finished the verse, they all started over again. Ribsy did not enjoy the singing. It was just noise to him. He flopped down on the seat and tried to ignore the girls, but he could not. He was too warm. He was surrounded by the unwanted smell, and the girls were too noisy for his sensitive ears. The singers were carried away by the song as they drove into the garage. Sweet violets! They were singing as loud as they could while they tumbled out of the station wagon. Sweeter than all the roses! No one remembered to hang on to Ribsy, who knew an opportunity when he saw one. He leaped from the station wagon, slipped past the girls, and burst out of the garage into the damp and dusk, where he began running as fast as he could, down the driveway and across the road and across some woodsy vacant lot toward the highway. Behind him, the singing stopped. He got away, shrieked Zibby. Catch him! Catch him! screamed the younger girls. Here, hey, come back here, called Mr. Dingley. Ribsy paid no attention. 
His feet were on asphalt now, and he was going fast, putting as much distance as he could between himself and all those girls and George. The voices grew faint in the distance, but Ribsy kept on running. After a while, he felt safe from the girls, but still he ran, trying to outrun the smell of violets. This he could not do, and when at last he could no, he could run no more, he stopped and rolled in the dirt and gravel in a ditch at the edge of the highway to try to free himself from the hated smell. He rolled and rubbed and wriggled on his back with his four feet in the air, but nothing helped. The smell clung no matter what he did. Panting and exhausted and hungry, Ribsy lay in the ditch and wondered what to do next. And you'll find that out next chapter.